the voices of Batman the Animated Series. We have Diane Pershing, the original Poison Ivy. We have John Glover, the Riddler. And Kevin Conroy, Batman himself. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman! If ever there was somebody who embodied Batman. Uh, so, I'm going to be asking a few questions up here, but we'd love to get questions from the audience. So what I'm asking you guys to do is if you want to just form a line right here, and then we're going to have them stand right here when they're ready to ask the question. And then I'll come up and ask you guys to ask your question away. First, I want to thank you all so much for coming. I have been big fans of... Let me scroll a little bit. I have been big, big fans of all your work. Um, Kevin, as we said, you are the embodiment of Batman. Thank you. You have also recently been able to play Batman live action. Wasn't that wild? <laughs> they told me I'm going to do Batman. I got so excited. And they said, and we're putting you in a metal bodysuit. <laughs> I didn't know anything about that coming up. So it was a challenge. It was a challenge. But how did it feel having voiced Batman for so many years and now being his face? It was interesting. That's a good question because uh, we've talked about this before among us. When you do voice work, you're in a booth and you sort of live in your own imagination. You create the character in your head and you create the situation that you're in. And it's very liberating. Um, I find it very liberating. When you're working on a set, there's a camera right in front of your face. There's a cameraman behind the camera. There's a boom operator over your head. There's lighting people. There's the wardrobe woman coming up and pulling on your shirt. There's the makeup person shoving, you know? There's this whole crew that are poking and tugging at you while you're trying to create this character. So that sense of, of living in your own imagination of that character, is so much harder when you do something on camera. I think, I think, for me. So it was really challenging to do that. Um, and also, the interpretation of Batman, well, Bruce Wayne, was totally opposite to what I have done. My Bruce Wayne never kills, um, always does the positive thing. My Batman. And their take on it was that they ask themselves the question, what happens if someone gives and gives and gives their whole life long? What's left? And there was this sort of empty shell of a bitter old man. That was the opposite of my Batman. So that was challenging for me to play that character, but I had a lot of fun. Now, on the note of acting in front of the camera versus being a voice, Diane, you are, I've worked with a lot of voice actors, but it just amazed me when I see how many voices that I've heard that you have been. Uh, you were D uh, Dale Arden on uh, Flash Gordon. Uh, you were the original Spinnerette and, uh, and Net Tassa on She-Ra. Um, of course, you were Poison Ivy. Um, how, how is it having done so many voices and then finding an iconic one that just everybody is attached on to. It is amazing. It is wonderful. You do a job 30 years ago, 30, 3 years ago, and you have no idea that 30 years later, you're going to be sitting in front of, first of all, an audience like this, okay? Then also the fans that come up with stories that can break your heart or, or, or make you feel... So you wonder, as an actor, you work in a void. You have the script, 
you say the words, you please the director, and it's done, and you get paid and you go home. You know, or actually, you go home and you get paid a lot later. But okay, <laughs> but then to find out that work that you did, that was a job which you loved, had an impact on people, changed their lives. How many people have come up to me today, just today, and said, you were my childhood? So many people. And wow, wow. So, so you, give, you give to us by watching our stuff and doing all that stuff. We're giving to you, and we had no idea. And it's kind of wonderful. So that's how it feels. And then, John, you've been part of so many things that are, for lack of a better term, deep culture. You know, you were Gremlins 2, Mr. Clamp, I can never forget that. Uh, you were in Scrooge. You were Lionel Luther from Smallville. And you were Riddler. And um, how does it feel for you to go back and forth between being recognized for your face and then being recognized for your voice separately? Well, I don't consider myself a voice actor uh, because I just did the Riddler. And, uh, and then there was the shiny pants before that. But people dropped out or they moved up and I just sort of that role of the Riddler dropped in my lap. And, uh, and I lived about a, a block or two from where it was recorded. So I, and I'm only in three episodes. And um, um, I would walk over and have a ball with all these wonderful voice actors. And, uh, and I, I had fun. I had a great time, and that, I think, is why the Riddler, one of the reasons that the Riddler is, uh, is so loved and adored by so many people, because uh, he, he, he just uh, throws it away. He's so cocksure of himself that he had a swell time just <laughs> fooling all the dummies. <laughs> uh, do, I, do I send something autobiographical in that? <laughs> oh, you got my number. <laughs> Well, let me grab some questions here from the audience. Who's first? Hi, uh, big fan, of course. Um, uh, yes, big fan. Um, I guess this is for Kevin Conroy. Uh, what was the most fun you had working on a Batman project, or which was your favorite to work on? Because I know you did the Arkham games as well, which I know a lot of people love. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to see what you had the most fun with. The question was, what was the most fun project I worked on? I think the one, I, anything that involves Mark Hamill. Uh, <laughs> is the most fun. Because he is a madman. He's brilliant. He's generous. He loves watching other actors work. So he gives you a lot of energy. And, the, you know, acting is like reacting. You're only as good as the people you're working with. If you're working with someone who's like a block of wood, there's only so much you can do. But if you're working with someone who's giving you this mad, brilliant performance, you can not be good. You know what I mean? He pulls it out of you. So anything involving Mark. So, um, The Killing Joke, um, The Arkham Games, and all that stuff uh, is phenomenal. And he made us crack up during the recording. Sometimes we couldn't catch our breath and say yeah. our lines. Mark, I mean, he would come up with all this stuff. It was amazing. He's amazing. He's got a brain like no other. Andrea Romano, who was the casting director. Whoa, she great. One day, came into the studio and said, Okay, I'm separating you two. We're taking a time out. Because we had become like two-year-olds. We were feeding off of each other, and we'd gone completely off script. She said, okay, we need, you need a time out. So uh, that's, that's what he does to me. I love him. Did, uh, was most of the series recorded with multiple actors together? Well, that's a wonderful thing yes. about Warner Brothers and Andrea Romano. 
they insist on having everyone present. So, and that's unique because it makes the post-production harder for the studio because getting clean takes sometimes is hard. But they know that they get much better performances from people if you have those other actors feeding them. So they always try to have us all together in the room. But sometimes it's impossible. Like part of, I think it was Arkham Knight, Mark was in London doing a Star Wars comeback. So we couldn't be together. So I had to imagine what he would do. But by that point, we'd worked together for 20 years. So I knew, I knew. But yes, they always try to have us in the studio together. And not only that, but we as actors, most of us are theater trained. And we got to look at each other's eyes while we were talking and have actual physical reactions and, you know, facial reactions and body reactions that you don't really pick up when you do one and there and one there and one there and one there. You I can. think that's part of what made the show unique, Batman the Animated Series, because it was really the first time that I know of that the studios um, actively looked outside the traditional voiceover casting pool and they looked at stage actors and TV actors and film actors. Before that, there had been a, a group of actors who specialized in voices, in animation voices. And they're incredible. They're wildly talented. One person can do a dozen different voices. But they had the idea of looking beyond that. And that's how I got the job. It was the first voice job I ever got. Because I was a New York stage actor. And I happened to be in LA doing a, a pilot for a series. And a casting director from New York knew my work from the public theater, the Shakespeare Theater in New York. And he recommended me to Andrea. So it was, a, it was just a lucky break that I ended up with this job. Diane, um, was it yes. a big difference from previous voice acting roles you've done before? I'm assuming a lot of those, if not all of the other ones prior to that, were individual recordings. No, actually, uh, a lot of the work that I did for Filmation, all of us were there. As well? Yeah. It's just what it was, was the circle that we had a semicircle with the microphones, and or it was this way, actually, and the booth was there, where you guys are, and the scripts were so brilliant. I'm, I'm just saying, I think the other parts of the show, the scripts were amazing, the characters were so interesting. The other stuff I'd done, not to downplay it, but was more simplistic. It just didn't need that real acting ensemble feel where this show is just heads and tails above most of the animation that's been done. It's just that simple. Yeah. Uh, Mic drop. John, then you did mostly uh, acting in front of the camera, and you said this was your first, if not only, experience doing voice acting. Um, did it help being able to see the other actors? Were you in the room with some of the actors at the time? Yeah, sure. I mean, it was, it was like we were all playing together, like like a rehearsal for a play or whatever. And what Diane said about the writing, because there were three scripts that involved uh, Riddler and just, uh, it was genius writing. So I just could go like Thank you, God, for this script, right? <laughs> and I learned something new today. Mark was in Star Wars? <laughs> Little known fact. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, what is it like from going? It's kind of a bit of two part, but they're sort of connected. Um, what? Do you, what was it like working on the animated series and going to the DC animated universe, like Justice League and stuff like that? What do you feel like the tone was changed and? How did you feel like it captured all aspects of it? Like, that was it for me? Is it for yeah. me? Uh, it, was, it was different. The question was what was the difference between doing Batman the Animated Series and then going on to Justice League? Because unlike a lot of other cartoons, this was an ongoing universe that they yeah. kind of created. But the challenge for me was I was the central character in Batman the Animated Series. I had, you know, a half an hour to tell a story, to tell my story. In the Justice League, suddenly I'm one of seven principal characters. 
and I'm the strong, silent one. You know? He's the guy who never talks. Well, I'm a voice actor. So what am I going to do? So some, some episodes I'd have one or two sentences to establish who I was, you know? And you can't overdo it. You can't overact. That's the temptation. Um, so it was challenging. You're right. It was challenging to, to share the stage with that many other lead characters. I'd like to imagine that you would just be standing in the booth just quietly brooding and staring at everybody else while they read their lines. Is that accurate? Please tell me that's right. That's accurate, but they wouldn't pay me if that's right. Um, speaking about the transition, um, have you heard of the new Batman anime series, Batman the Cake Crusader? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I've heard some stuff about that. I'm not sure. I haven't heard, heard a lot. Yeah, because, um, I'm just kind of curious your opinion because it looks like it's kind of feels like the closest to a spiritual successor to the animated series as it's going to go more into like the early 20s and 30s noir version of Batman or something like that. Is that that's the Paul Dini one? Well, the, I think that's the Paul Dini one. The question here uh, can be extended a little bit further and that is have you watched other people take on roles that you filled? And then how does it feel seeing them take those on? Oh, of course. Dietrich Bader is a really good friend, a really close friend. Uh, I think he does a great job with Batman. Um, when I met Adam West, I was kind of nervous when he came in to do The Grey Ghost because I was kind of treading on his territory. And I wasn't sure, you know, what the reaction would be. And he sensed that. And he, he just said, you know, it's your ride now. Have a blast. And that's my attitude about the other actors who come in to do the voices. It's their ride now. It's their turn. Uh, I love when I get chosen. But I also love hearing what other actors do with it. Same thing for Diane and Very generous. Yeah, that's a very generous uh, answer. Well, what are you going to do? Yeah, but it's true. It's true. Yeah, you just... I did the voice for eight or nine years, and then they chose somebody else. And at the time, I remember thinking, what did I do wrong? Why did they do that? Now, as the years go on, and I'm appreciated for what I did do, which is nice, I love it, it's marvelous, I think, hmm, somebody else gets to have a chance. So I feel I'm more generous as I age. <laughs> I was less so when I was younger. You were a bitch when you were young? <laughs> well, honey, you should know. Now you know how we talk backstage. <laughs> and on the note of that language, a young man here... <laughs> there are children pleasant. Right? Well, at least one boy wonder. For uh, Mr. Conroy, so besides from the line that you said when you first walked up, do you have a favorite line, and if so, can you say it? <laughs> say it, I am vengeance. In all the years to come, in all your private moments, yes. <laughs> I want you to remember, Clark, my hand at your throat. I want you to remember the one man who beat you. Thank you so much. As an extension, is there a favorite Riddler moment or favorite Poison Ivy? You want to go first, John? Uh, yeah. If you're so smart, why aren't you rich? <laughs> and mine is, they can bury us in the ground as deep as they want. But we always grow back, don't we, baby? It's a little creepy. <laughs> Appropriately dark. I am a big animated series fan, but unfortunately, I married a Smallville fan up there. And so I have to ask the question. question to Mr. Glover. What did you take from animated series into Smallville? What experiences, or like, uh, what, what experience, inspiration put Riddler into, into Lionel? Well, they're all in my body. 
Um, I, I, I don't quite know how to... Well, you've played a lot of villains, and Lionel was the closest to a true villain the first couple seasons of Smallville had. Right. And they, uh, and I was, uh, I, I'd, I'd gone through a period where I started, uh, I'd never had an acting teacher. And I, and I was, uh, start, I was in LA and I was getting hired a lot and it became more about money than it did about doing the work. So I found a teacher that I had heard of for years and years and I balled up and, and went and took a class. Um, and uh, I, I just, learned how to have fun again and and do the work so so there was a, a, a period where I wasn't enjoying it at all and uh, and the, with the Lionel I could see that they'd sort of written they'd sort of written they'd written a villain and you know a, kind of a comic book villain it was not even as, so I just kept bringing more love into the man realizing that uh, he I loved him so much, I gave him shock treat. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Everyone else saw him as giving evil, but he was giving love. But, but, I, but people would stop me on the street, finally, when it, when it got going. And, and, and so we were so confused. Were you supposed to be a good guy or a bad guy? And I felt like I had been a challenge and made him a human man who had his flaws. and did bad things sometimes, but he was not all bad, and he loved his son somehow, in some ways, although I'm so disappointed in him. <laughs> anyway, so, I mean, that's my attack. I just, uh, a little story about getting to, uh, just working for money. You do enjoy the work, it's much more pleasant. Is there any way in which a villain's story, whether it's yours or a villain that you interacted with, could have gone further, that you would have wanted to see more of that kind of a, a emotional thread or, or a villainous thread that they, they had started? That's hard because the writers were really good at fleshing out the characters, especially the villains. And my first instinct when you asked that question was to say, well, another Mr. Freeze would have been wonderful. Just because Michael and Sarah was such a wonderful actor. He gave such passion to that character. Um, but then I was thinking about the stuff I did with him, like Sub-Zero and Heart of Ice, and I was thinking, I kind of did do that, you know, because the writers were so good at that. So it's, it's a hard question to answer because our writers were amazing. That's why it still holds up. That's why I can't tell you how many people have come to my table today with their kids or their grandkids. Three and generations. Said, and said, oh, they're just getting into it now and they can't stop watching it. They love it. Because it's such high quality. I got kind of got a little in two part. One's for Mr. Glover. If you can, I'm just curious, like what kind of inspired? You? I feel like uh, your portrayal of uh, Lionel was probably one of my favorite parts of all built. So, what kind of motivated? What was kind of your inspiration? What you used to play to Lionel? And uh, also for uh, for the BTAS cast, is there any chance we'll ever see if something to bridge what happened between uh, Justice League and Batman Beyond? So let's do about one part at a time. So love was my <laughs> no no truly love. I, I put that ingredient in, and a lot of it. And sometimes it was heavy with love, and sometimes there was anger, but, but, but there was a base of love that I think, uh, and, and enjoyment of, of, his, of his cleverness. So he it, it was sort of like the Riddler in a, in a bit of a way, and his cockiness and his feeling about himself. Cocky's a good word, isn't it? It is. It is. The, but you know, the bottom line on anyone who plays a villain 
is that they don't get to look at, them, at themselves as playing a villain. They think they're the hero of the story, and what they're doing is the right thing to do. And if you play that, in other words, if you don't judge the character the way the audience is going to, it really fleshes it out. With Poison Ivy, even though it was such a great story, I, I, I introduced my granddaughter when she was about five years old to watching one of the series. Um, and she watched it and she went, Grandma, she's not very nice, is she? <laughs> and I said, no, honey, and I had such a good time playing. <laughs> You know, it's interesting, um, John, you had said that you wanted to put a lot of love and heart into Lionel, and he evolved into kind of a good, like a fully straightforward good character by, by the end of his storyline, and I feel like as a viewer, that the writers were responding to your, to your performance. They, yeah, they were picking up stuff that I was doing. They, they saw what I was going for, and they, they came along with me, I guess. We came together. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and on that same note, Diane, uh, prior to your performance, Poison Ivy had always been a straightforward villain. And I think uh, it was through your performance, where she didn't see herself as a bad person, that no. she is now an anti-hero. She's now considered to be sometimes one of the good guys. Well, it's the wildest thing, isn't it? You know, because she really, I mean, she's evil, guys. She kills people. <laughs> Very clear, you don't get for fun, you know. True. But, but, they they but, it. but she has a through line, which is I am trying to save the planet, and that is noble and wonderful. So, what a dichotomy for the character, and how much fun to play her! Oh, I had such a good time. So, Woo. stop. So the second question was, the Batman Beyond series takes place many decades later. So I guess, would there ever be a chance from your point of view as voice actors to reprise the same roles of these characters in the decades in between? In between Batman We're and I'm available. Oh yeah. yeah I would love My it. agent is waiting. Come on. Oh, Come on. Let's, let's start a write-in campaign, please. <laughs> The onus is on you. <laughs> Hi. So, Hi. my question is for Kevin, but also for the entire crew. Uh, as we've all kind of grown up with your series from multiple generations now, and we all look to your character, or sorry, we all look to your characters more as like ideologies and mythologies that we follow in our own hearts and like grow with. Who inspires you guys very often from the past when you were doing the roles, as well as even today? Huh. So are there any other either real-life people or maybe other actors that inspired you? Well, uh, uh, when I was introduced to Batman, um, it was literally at the audition. I had only known Adam West's take on the show. I had never read any of the comic books. So I didn't know this dark, gritty... Um, dual identity uh, aspect of Batman. I didn't, I didn't know the drama of it. And uh, Bruce Timm kind of had to take me up to speed. And when he described it to me, what he's really doing, I said, well, you're, this is the Robin Hood story. This is a, a retelling of Robin Hood. And the more I thought about it, there was this wonderful movie from the 40s or the 30s with um, Leslie Howard called um, The Scarlet Pimpernel. And if you've never seen it, you should see it. It's a great movie. And he plays this aristocrat from the French court during the terror of the French Revolution. And he saves people who are going to be guillotined at night. And the way he disguises himself during the day is he's this fop in the court. You know, he's, he's flamboyant, he's uh, sarcastic, he's the center of, he's the brunt of humor, he's the exact opposite of who he is at night. And so that, that inspired me, was, was that performance. I thought, wouldn't that be interesting if Bruce Wayne and Batman were that different? 
And Bruce Wayne was this sarcastic, charming playboy. And Batman was this dark, brooding vigilante. And that's where I came up the, with the idea for two voices. So, so that did inspire me. And I later found out, just like six months ago, um, do you know the book, uh, The Boy Who Loved Batman? It's a great book. Uh, Michael uh, Uslan. Um, he told me, and I didn't know this, that Bob Kane's inspiration for Batman was the Scarlet Pimpernel. Oh, wow. Isn't that wild? I never knew that. Isn't that interesting how two artists' brains can go to the same place? And it's an obscure place. Because when Michael heard me say that during an interview, he said, well, you know Bob Kane, that was his inspiration for the role. And I said, no, no one's ever told me that. Isn't that wild? It's a great story. I didn't come to Poison Ivy. I didn't even know uh, about Poison Ivy. Um, I just came, I, I, happened, to, I happened to come to the, the, the first recording, Poison, uh, Pretty Poison, which was her first uh, appearance, uh, as a, get, a little an incidental role, you know, a secretary or a policewoman or something like that. And the actress that was supposed to play Poison Ivy uh, didn't for various reasons. And Andrea came up to me and said, would you like to audition for this? And I looked at the character, and to me she looked like Tinkerbell on hormones, you know. And, and, I, and I said, okay, tell me about her. And she says, you know, well, she plants, and she this, and she that. And she uses her feminine stuff to get places. And I went, oh, I had two voices in my head immediately. I didn't, I didn't have a person. I had a voice, which was my cosmetic voice, which I used all the time when I was trying to sell perfume <laughs> or various other things. And then she was a PhD, Dr. Pamela Isley. So I said, oh, she has brains. And I've always been told that when I talk, I really sound intelligent, that my voice just sounds, I mean, this has nothing to do with anything except this is how I sound, intelligent. So I said, okay, so I'll do the sexy voice, but I'll put a little edge in it so that you think that she's kind of got something else going on. Like that? So that was my inspiration. And then I read the script. And I went, oh boy! So it's really kind of fun. John, is there anyone who's inspired you? Oh God. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I, not, I, I just... Again, I repeat, it was these three scripts that were, were written so well that I had a blast doing it. I didn't realize what was going on. I'd never watched it. I, I mean, I was a grown-up, so I wasn't going to watch Saturday morning cartoons, I thought. And it, it was at these Comic-Cons that I learned how meaningful they, they, they are for so many people. So this was an awakening for me. I, I, when ignorance is bliss, was my folly to be wise. So I just, you know, had a blast. And somehow it, because of a great script, worked. And then there you are. He's just a to. natural. It's that simple. Shucks. John, as an aside, it occurs to me you also acted alongside Poison Ivy in live action. In Batman and Robin. Batman and Uma Thurman. Oh boy, you know. Was that similar at all to working on the show? <laughs> similar? No. <laughs> no, because Uma, Poison Ivy, had to kill me. And she killed me with a kiss. And now there was Uma Thurman. And she just, she would just mess up all the time. So we kept having to do it again and again and again and again. And this tongue down my throat and that tongue. <laughs> And finally, finally she got it. So it was about 25 takes. And it was just a rough day. I hope you don't believe me, because I just made this up. It was a dream. I have had many nights.
the fake half question is, do you guys know about the unauthorized Batman musical? What? No. It's called Holy Musical Batman, and it's free on YouTube. Okay, and it's the what? Holy Musical Batman. Oh, how fun. It's free on YouTube. Um, it's a lot of fun. There's, they make up a new villain. His name is Candyman, and he poisons the Gotham water supply with a giant warhead. Um, it's a fun time. Any, uh, my actual question is, you were talking about how you kind of built the voice for Poison Ivy. I was wondering, um, for all of you, for a lot of people, including me, the voices that you gave your characters are just kind of the definitive voices of the characters, even when a lot of people read the comics, they just hear your voices. So how did you kind of create those voices and sort of make it sound like the character could also have your own twist on it? So where did that voice come from? That unique voice that when we see Riddler, see Poison Ivy, see Batman or Bruce Wayne? I've already answered this. Fair. So then John and Kevin? I just was me. I didn't know you had to make up a voice. I just did it and had fun doing it. It was that stupid thing where I, I could see that he thinks he's smarter than every person in the world. So that cocky. And cocky, that's your cocky, voice. Cocky, cocky, cocky. <laughs> John, you're just an enigma. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here all week. Okay, uh, um, um, I came up with it during the audition. Because I was kind of dancing as fast as I could. You know, I was just improvising in front of the producers. And they described the character, his drama, the, the tragedy of his youth. And I just put myself into that head. And I was thinking about watching my parents murdered in front of me in an alley in Gotham. And where that would send me. And how I would compensate for that. And I just went to this dark, broody, sexy voice. <laughs> so, you know, voice actors use their imagination. And uh, that's where you find the voice. Kevin, I wanted to ask you a question. You mentioned uh, your audition a few times. You recently had an autobiographical comic published. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you about that because that was really amazing. Um, that published in, I think, was it DC Pride? Yeah. Um, can you tell us about the experience, about what made you want to write that and what it was like getting it on the page and seeing artists bring it to life? Well, I've always, uh, I enjoy writing. I've always enjoyed writing, and um, they, the DC asked me for Pride Month, they were going to do a special edition, um, and would I be willing to write uh, a story uh, about being an actor, and I'm 66, I've been acting since I was 20, and, um, you know, gay, and working in a business that was not terribly gay friendly. And uh, they wanted to know what it was like to work. And I thought, they're looking for a, a, a feel-good story, I'm sure. And I said to them, well, you know, it's not going to be a feel-good story, if I'm going to be honest. So I decided to make it as personal. You know, writing is only, it's only good if it costs you something. If there's a certain amount of blood on the page. You expose yourself. If you play it safe, you never create anything interesting. You have to take risks. All art is like that. So I thought, I'm just going to lay it out there. Tell these very ugly incidents that happened from my early career um, that are kind of unbelievable now when you read them. You think, oh, no one would actually say that to an actor. But they did. Um, and, the, and the personal traumas that people always forget that actors are people and we carry burdens just like you all do. Um, I had a father who was a, a, a fall down drunk, a very abusive man, a, 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 a cruel person who I ended up taking care of in his old age. I had a brother who was severely schizophrenic and I supported him for 35 years until he just passed a year ago. So. These are aspects of actors' lives that you never hear about because 
People don't advertise that stuff. Um, it's just what you live with. And I thought that would be so interesting to use those dramas of my life to show that when you're dealing with the bullshit of the business, pardon my French, you're also dealing with the bullshit of life, like all humans do. Um, so that's what I wanted people to get at. And, and I think they have. The, the reaction has been really positive. Bravo. insane in one way and uh, Riddler is insane in another way so I just the, the look first because I, I wanted the Bride of Frankenstein kind of hair that helped um, and uh, I, it's all down to again imagination and you know what you do when you trying to figure out who somebody is and how you can make them interesting and uh, yeah. And he had fun. <laughs> and I had fun. <laughs> um, also, just to all of you, going from like an acting, um, voice acting and to acting, what was your favorite between the two? Would you prefer voice acting or actual acting? <sighs> That's hard. Because they're, uh, I think acting on stage is always going to be my first love. I just love it. Because of that, the communication that happens with the audience. You know when they're with you, and you know when they're not with you. Uh, there's an energy in the theater I just love. Yeah, and it's always different. And you're on your own. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you can't cut. If you lose a word, you gotta figure it out how. How to get out of there. Yeah, get out, yeah. And then it is, the audiences give so much back yeah. to uh, uh, actors on the stage. Yeah. It, it's a whole other world when you're acting on stage and or for the camera. Um, there's so much work you have to do to get to that point to be able to do that. Whereas, frankly, with voice work, you audition, you get it or you don't, and then you go to the studio. You don't have to worry if you have a pimple, if you've gained 10 pounds. I'm serious. If your voice isn't... if the, There's just stuff that's... It's a different kind of career. That's not what the question was. but. That's very much part of it. For me, I've always adored being in front of an audience. As you can tell, I mean, I look at you guys, come on. But I, I, but I know, but I, I, I love acting, and I love acting on stage. But I found voice work more satisfying in my personal life, because I got to raise children, make a decent living, work part-time so I could be home with them, those kinds of things. So I don't know if that answers anything but it sort of is what it is. I think one thing to remember about that, about the different venues for acting, is that TV is really the, the venue of the writers. They're in charge. Film is the venue of the director. He's in charge. He controls what gets on that film. Theater is the venue of the actor. Well said. Because when you're on stage, you create that moment. And you control the dialogue with the audience. So that's just naturally, I think, where most actors feel more alive. I think we only have time for about one or two more questions. So great. great questions so far, guys. Yeah, really good questions. I'm really loving these, by the way. And, and out of curiosity, is there ever a time when a voice actor showed up in the Batman the Animated Series, just pajamas and like slippers and stuff? No, we would uh, probably call the police. Uh, so these uh, characters, they're easy to get wrong. And, uh, but I feel the late 80s and the early 90s was a great moment to reinvent 
Batman and all these characters. Uh, and the great thing about them is they had so much heart. Um, a lot of it was, of course, the script, but it's what you bring to the table. And Thank I remember you. scenes like, uh, you know, uh, Poison Ivy and Harley Quinn when they get together and Poison Ivy giving tips to Harley Quinn about love life and Batman dealing with the ghost of his father when facing Scarecrow. There was so much heart in it that gives uh, that there was nuance to these characters. And I'm wondering, you've had 30 years to chew on these characters. Uh, can you tell us uh, about your understanding of who these characters are? Well, I think one thing to remember is that these, these shows were never kid shows. They had to be kid friendly, but they were really geared towards young adults, like college age. That was the biggest audience. Batman the Animated Series originally was a prime time show on Fox. That's how it started. Um, so those characters were complicated. They show the passion and the pathos of Mr. Freeze, even as he's trying to wipe out a city. You know, that's complicated. Uh, so for actors, that gives you so much to chew on, you know. Uh, but no, you're right. The, the, the characters are so well-rounded. And I think that's why audiences today, who get introduced to it now, get so excited about it. Anyone else? I should watch it sometime. <laughs> and just see, I mean, I... I Watch Michael and Sarah do Mr. Fruits. It's unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> All right, so one last question. So my question is kind of related to what Kevin just mentioned, how he kind of said it was geared toward more young adults. I remember like the animated series, Justice League and Static Shock were kind of marketed towards kids. But I feel like, I would always feel like when I was in kindergarten and people would be like, oh, this show is too dark or things like that. Do you feel like there were ever like episodes or things that you felt were like too dark for like the younger audiences? I, I actually did. I, I mean, and I, they were very aware of that. Because they, Bruce Tim wanted to push the boundaries. He absolutely wanted to. And Warner Brothers pushed back. Uh, because they wanted it to be kid friendly. So there were moments where I thought, whoa, this is getting a little heavy. Um, so yes, that, that, that was an issue that came up. I had no control over anything. I was simply saying the words that the people wrote for me. Yeah. That's it. Wa-O-C. <laughs> no, I was multilingual, did you? <laughs> I was just thinking of the Riddler being trapped in his own mind for a while. And I'm like, that's, that's a really dark episode to see as a kid, you know? But, uh, okay. I, I, I'm sorry, I feel like I went too far. I think you're swell. <laughs> well, on that note, I want to thank all of you so much for coming here, and I want to thank you guys so much for those questions. And come visit us at our tables, okay? John, Diane, and Kevin are going to be at their tables for about 10 more minutes today, but they are going to be there all day tomorrow as well. So thank you all we so much. We're closing soon. Thank you all. We'll be here tomorrow.